we will start with the uh, the next session, which will be about uh, the preoperative management of cardiac risk for non-cardiac surgery. And uh, you'll have to bear up with me for this uh, next session. So uh, it's essentially a kind of uh, what I would say uh, continuation of what we did last week, which was uh, evaluation of the cardiac risk prior to a non-cardiac surgery. And this is, uh, can we do something in the preoperative uh, period about uh, uh, the cardiac risk before a non-cardiac surgery? We, we do know that cardiovascular complications such as myocardial infarction, heart failure, or a death which is attributable to coronary heart disease pose some of the most significant risks to patients undergoing major non-cardiac surgery. So we, we are quite aware that cardiac morbidity and mortality, pulmonary morbidity, mortality are possibly the two most worrisome complications or uh, adverse outcomes after uh, any non-cardiac surgery, along with possibly neurological. Uh, as I said, uh, in the previous week, we discussed about evaluation of cardiac risk prior to a non-cardiac surgery, the perioperative evaluation of uh, the uh, coronary artery disease, heart failure, and we also dealt with uh, valvular heart disease and what uh, risk evaluation in valvular heart disease do we do. Uh, if you look at cardiac risk factors that would bother before a non-cardiac surgery, it's obviously things like heart failure, uh, coronary artery disease and the the incidence or the if there is the presence of an acute coronary syndrome valvular heart disease arrhythmias and hypertension uh, since we kind of discussed uh, already about what needs to be done if there is heart failure and especially about uh, especially a uh, a decompensated heart failure or a resistant heart failure, which is resistant to therapy. I think the, the, the take home message uh, that we figured out was that if it is stable heart failure, then both urgent emergency surgery can go ahead. Stable heart failure, uh, good functional status, uh, elective surgery can go ahead without further testing, without further modification. But it is in the decompensated heart, and uh, if it, uh, it, 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 it there is a decompensated heart, and you uh, uh, the patient needs an urgent or uh, um, emergency surgery, you still might have some time, maybe six, uh, twelve hours, twenty four hours, to try and compensate. But in the resistant heart failure group, then you have to really take a hard call as to whether. Uh, this person should go ahead with a non-cardiac surgery or not because the risks, the post-operative outcomes are very, very bad. You have to take a hard call, a consensus opinion to be arrived at as to whether the person will benefit from that particular non-cardiac surgery. With uh, valvular disorders, it was, it again is about whether the valvular heart disease is the person is symptomatic or the person is stable despite even uh, severe, not forget the moderate uh, stenotic valve or this uh, mild stenotic valve, even with a severe stenotic valve as per the anatomical definition of it. If they're not symptomatic, you can go ahead with the elective non-cardiac surgery. But if it is symptomatic, you will have to uh, address the valve issue first before you go ahead with a uh, with a non-cardiac surgery. Arrhythmias, the most bothersome arrhythmias would be the, the malignant bradyarrhythmias like uh, uh, the complete heart block wherein that needs to be addressed whether with a, with a, per, a temporary or a permanent uh, solution and then taken up. And if it is the common arrhythmias like an atrial fibrillation, if this, there are no symptoms, if the ventricular rate is controlled, then possibly you again go ahead with the non-cardiac surgery but if it is not so then uh, the cause evaluation is done or a new onset atrial fibrillation it, the the cause needs to be figured out before you uh, proceed with a non-cardiac surgery so since we discussed this the last time we will not do it this time what we will discuss over the next half an hour or so would be revascularization prior to 
a uh, surgery, whether they need it or not, and then what needs to be done with these cardiovascular drugs, which the patients would be the management of these drugs, like beta blockers, antiplatelets, clonidine, or any other alpha two agonists, statins, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs, and the nitrates. Uh, before we proceed further, can we, Jyoti, can you can we start off the poll questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so we'll start off the poll questions. And again, the poll questions are essentially trying to figure out what the take home message is. And uh, you uh, please feel free. It is uh, completely con uh, 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 confidential. Nobody gets to know who is answering what. So, but uh, please feel free to answer them. It's like a multiple choice. You have to just uh, click on the, what do you think is the right choice or the right opinion? And uh, we will come out with the answers at the end of the uh, session. So the first uh, MCQ or the first poll is about which of the following is not an antiplatelet drug. So, or which of these following do not have anti platelet function is it ibuprofen or is it ticargalor prasugrel or is it heparin so all you have to do is tell us what is what do you think which of these do not have uh, anti platelet action so if you are done, this is very simple. We'll proceed to the next one. Uh, the next poll question comes up now. And this is about uh, like, it's about decision making. Okay. Uh, so there's a 55 year old male with known coronary artery disease, so symptomatic, uh, score of three, angina three, breathlessness three is diabetic. Uh, I, I'm sh I'm sorry, this should have been a, a female. It is a 55-year-old female. I'm sorry about the typing error over there. Has CA breast. The plan is uh, breast surgery, uh, surgical oncology. Uh, she has METS of 3, a DASI score. We, we discussed hugely on this last uh, Friday. Uh, they decided that since they need surgery and there is poor functional status, there is a stress test which came out positive. Uh, the surgical oncologist feels that they can wait for six weeks plus. And the cardiology opinion is this person needs a revascularization and they are doing the percutaneous uh, intervention. And uh, so, what, what will be the plans to you? after revascularization with dual antiplatelet therapy after six weeks will you continue aspirin and clopidogrel and proceed for surgery six weeks down the line would you continue stop clopidogrel for five days continue aspirin proceed for surgery would you stop clopidogrel continue aspirin start low molecular weight heparin and proceed for surgery or would you say clopidogrel, stop aspirin, start tarofiban, and then proceed for surgery? So take your time. And uh, let us know what you feel about this. Post drug eluting stent with dual antiplatelet therapy, needing a CA breast surgery, what do you think you do when, he come, when the lady comes six weeks down the line? Continue aspirin and, and clopidogrel and proceed for surgery, or just stop clopidogrel, continue aspirin and then go for surgery, or stop clopidogrel, continue with the aspirin, start the low molecular weight heparin and can go for surgery, or is it... Uh, Stop clopidogrel, stop aspirin, aspirin, and start tarofiban, and go ahead for surgery. I think we'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, zero. We'll go to the next poll question. Okay. So the next poll question. 
is uh, a 65 year old male similar kind of a thing known coronary art disease art, uh, artery disease ccs3 nyh3 and but this person has a brain tumor and needs a neurosurgery again uh, the uh, opinion of the third neurosurgeon is that that person can wait for 6 weeks cardiology opines for uh, percutaneous in, uh, intervention so they think about uh, they have decided to put in a drug eluting stent with dual antiplatelet therapy 6 weeks down the line now what will you do stop aspirin and clopidogrel for 5 days and proceed for surgery or stop only clopidogrel continue with aspirin and proceed for surgery stop clopidogrel continue aspirin again start low molecular weight heparin and continue for surgery or stop clopidogrel for 5 days stop aspirin for 3 days start tyrofiban and continue for surgery similar kind of a scenario like the previous one this one is neurosurgery again drug eluting stent dual antiplatelet therapy but 6 weeks down the line now the neurosurgeon wants to go in so what will you do stop both the dual antiplatelet therapy and proceed stop clopidogrel for 5 days continue aspirin proceed for surgery stop clopidogrel continue aspirin start low molecular weight heparin or stop clopidogrel for 5 days stop aspirin for 3 days start tyrofiban and then proceed for surgery i think i've given mm -hmm. enough time for you to think this is uh, so please put in your uh, uh, instead of putting it on the chat box uh, what uh, please put in into the poll you can uh, uh, answer there and uh, once you are done we'll proceed to the next one so the fourth poll question it's again about decision making so this is a 57 year old male with known coronary artery disease who is hypertensive and diabetic has ca thyroid the plan is thyroidectomy the functional status is good med scores are 6 the dasi score the duke activity status index score is 42 Uh, blood parameters are good ecg shows an anterolateral ischemia and uh, the left ventricular ejection fraction is 45% there is diastolic dysfunction so how, now that you are trying to reach a consensus opinion so you discuss with the cardiologist cardiac surgeon the uh, the thyroid surgeon then and you decide that uh, no we need to do an angiogram which should be followed by a cabg and then thyroidectomy after 6 months this other option is you discuss with the cardiologist cardiac surgeon the thyroid surgeon you think of doing an angiogram followed by angioplasty put in a drug eluting stent dual antiplatelet therapy then do a thyroidectomy after 6 months or you take a consensus opinion of the cardiologist the thyroid surgeon the patient and relatives you maximize medical therapy and would you then proceed with thyroidectomy so what would you do in this scenario would you decide to do an angiogram a cabg and then wait for 6 months and then do the thyroid surgery angiogram followed by a drug eluting stent dual antiplatelet therapy wait for 6 months and then take up for surgery or maximize medical therapy and proceed with thyroidectomy so this person has good functional status a reasonable dasi score what would you do i think if you have completed your voting we will go to the next and the last of the poll questions in 5 4 3 2 1 0 the next poll question again this is again about decision making and uh, this is a 55 year old known coronary artery disease who has a history of myocardial infarction 2 years back with a history of heart failure 9 months back Uh, diabetic ccs is 2 med scores are around 4 uh, 
the Duke Activity Status Index is around 34, just about OK. The heart rate is 82 per minute. Uh, serum uh, biochemistry and hematology parameters are OK. Now, this gentleman has chronic calculus cholecystitis and uh, would need a gallbladder surgery. Now, this obviously, the, you have decided that needs uh, beta blocker therapy. So what should be the ideal beta blocker therapy in this person? Would you start atenolol four weeks prior to surgery and go for a target heart rate of 60 to 70? Metoprolol four days, four days prior to surgery, target heart rate 60 to 70. Bisoprolol four hours prior to surgery with a target of 60 to 70. Or IV esmolol four minutes prior to surgery with a target of 60 to 70 heart rate. So you need uh, heart rate control in this gentleman, coronary artery disease, MI. So he's got all the indications for which you need uh, a beta blocker therapy. Unfortunately, he has not been on beta blocker therapy. When you are seeing him, you see the heart rate is 82. So what will you do? Atenolol four weeks before and then wait, take up for surgery. This person can wait. Uh, metoprolol four days prior to surgery, get a target to 60 to 70, which is the most ideal. Bisoprolol four hours prior to surgery, target 60 to 70. If it get the target, go in. IVS molol four minutes prior to surgery and then take it up. So again, let's see what the valued attendees think of about it. And we will go end the poll questions in five, four, three, two, one, zero, and we go to our deliberations. So thank you. Uh, I would just uh, begin with just trying to figure out why and what you need to manage about cardiac risks coming in for non-cardiac surgery. And uh, this is uh, about, uh, let's begin with the pathophysiology. Uh, this is uh, like a cartoon which I made quite some time back. And this is one of my favorite cartoons is that you see sur surgery uh, incites an inflammatory response and also a neuroendocrine stress response. Now, these are two things that a surgical insult will always do. Okay. And because of the inflammatory response, it leads to an hypercoagulable state during the surgical process. And in a person who has a coronary artery disease, who has plaque, this can lead to a plaque rupture. This leads to a th formation of a thrombus, a, a, an embolus, which can proceed further. And this leads to a scenario in that area where you can have a decreased oxygen delivery. Uh, the neuroendocrine stress response is responsible for the catecholamine surge. And that catecholamine surge changes the hemodynamic response. You have increased heart rate, blood pressure. And it also incites a metabolic change, uh, the, the, whether it is the growth hormone related, insulin related, uh, uh, glucocorticoid related. And these creates an environment of an increased oxygen demand and which creates this environment towards a perioperative myocardial injury infarction. So unless you handle this in a, in a setting that there is a compromised with the coronary artery, the vasculature, you have run the higher risk of having a perioperative uh, MI, which is what is the bothersome thing. So what else during surgery can make it worse? Yes, you have during surgery uh, fall in blood pressure. You have in surgery bleeding, which causes decrease in PCV or the hematocrit, which decreases again the ability of the hemoglobin to carry oxygen. Uh, any stage wherein the compromise with the gas exchange leading to an hypoxic event or a vasoconstriction around that area, which can decrease oxygen delivery. And uh, Metabolic changes like shivering in the post-operative period can increase the oxygen demand. All these are creating an atmosphere wherein your the myocardium can be jeopardized and it can lead to mitral injury, leading to the fatal MI that we are really, really bothered about. So all our efforts are in trying to see that these things do not happen. Okay. 
So the situations that we deal with in the pre-operative period is you might have a patient who has just had uh, acute coronary syndrome recently and now needs a non-cardiac surgery, which can be emergency surgery, urgent surgery, which can be an elective surgery. So how will you base your decisions on current that? A patient who has a known history of coronary artery disease and now needs an emergency or an urgent non-cardiac surgery. So how will you deal with that? Then you might have a scenario where there is a patient who has coronary artery disease is unstable, like the ones that we were talking about, a scenario like CCS3, NYHA3, uh, and uh, you possibly do stress tests and you figure out that there is instability. Uh, and might be needs some kind of coronary vascularization, maybe a CBG, maybe a percutaneous in intervention, and then at some point of time will need that non-cardiac surgery. And if you're lucky, then you might have somebody with a coronary artery disease stable and needs a non-cardiac surgery. I think these are the things that you are possibly going to deal with. So let us deal with the first scenario. A patient with a recent acute coronary syndrome so the management of the acute coronary syndrome is urgent revascularization. I think now the evidence is very strongly in is towards urgent revascularization, which and urgent revascularization will initiate the dual antiplatelet therapy. And because you initiate the dual antiplatelet therapy, it will lead to a delay in the timing of the proposed non-cardiac surgery. So you will have to accept that. And... Uh, then after you have done this, whatever intervention you have done, and the person is on dual antiplatelet therapy, when should you do the non-cardiac surgery? And this is these two things that bothers you. On one side is dual antiplatelet therapy. I will stop the dual antiplatelet therapy prematurely because I think you needs to go in for surgery and the surgery needs to happen. And because of this prime, uh, uh, the premature discontinuation of the dual antiplatelet therapy, am I sending this person more towards having a cardiac event? And to the other hand is, no, I cannot stop the dual antiplatelet therapy. Dual antiplatelet therapy needs to go on. And therefore, I delay surgery. And therefore, I am bothered about the poor quality of life. And more so in oncosurgery, the concern about the progression of cancer from an operable stage, you get into an inoperable stage. So that is the, the, the big, huge dilemma, to, which you need to get bothered about. What happens about patients who need urgent or emergent surgery? I think because the, uh, the procedure takes so much of the, uh, uh, the greater importance, I think everything else becomes secondary and the person needs to go in. So whether the person has a coronary artery disease and or a heart failure, stable heart failure, not bothered, even if it is decompensated, maybe the pathophysiology for which the person is needing the urgent or the emergency surgery can tip the person towards decompensation. You possibly try it for six to eight hours and then you have to go in. Even with a severe valvular heart disease, maybe symptomatic aortic stenosis, uh, if it is a bleeding abdomen, uh, you will have to go in, isn't it? You don't have much of a choice. You possibly can get a cardiologist on board if you know, and so that he can help you in the decision making as to what goal directed hematonomy monitoring and medication management, which needs to be done in the pre operative period and which needs to be uh, extended into the post operative period. That's what you would possibly think about doing. Uh, even the same thing, if with acute coronary syndrome, with a decompensated heart failure, the benefit and the risks, as I think that we were talking about this, about the heart failure, uh, you will have to take a real big call as to whether we need to go ahead with this surgery. Uh, unless it is life-saving, limb-saving, which most of your emergency surgery would be, I think you have no other choice but to go ahead. So it, it, it has to be individualized and it has to be a collective opinion. Don't take the X completely on your shoulder and uh, take a call on that. So coming to revascularization before surgery, let us ask a few questions. Who would need revascularization? If I'm leaving out those two uh, 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 the, uh, the subsets about acute need, 
this is about chronic. When do you do? And I think this is the perplexing question. When do you do the revascularization? And then when do you time the non-cardiac surgery? And what is the preferred revascularization? Is it a percutaneous intervention like an angioplasty stent? Or is it a coronary artery bypass grafting? And the question that uh, uh, especially percutaneous intervention brings in is the dual antiplatelet therapy, which you need to have the patients on. So I think the first thing which was answered, who needs revascularization prior to non-cardiac surgery? Anybody with an acute coronary syndrome will need it. But there are other things where patients might need. Suppose there is an elective non-cardiac surgery which can wait. You've done a risk assessment based upon both the surgical, the surgery, as well as the clinical risk, and you figured out that the MACE is possibly greater than 1%, maybe greater than even 5%. You find that the MET scores are low, the Duke activity scores are low, so functional status is poor. And there is a collective decision which says that we, yes, we will do further post -operative, uh, pre operative testing, which is includes an abnormal uh, stress testing, which comes out to be abnormal. And then the collective decision is that you have to, this person would benefit by revascularization. And this benefit is not just a short term perioperative benefit. The benefit is a long-term benefit even after the non-cardiac surgery. So these are the group of patients where maybe you will do um, revascularization. Uh, there are certain, uh, I think, which Dibbendu also talked about, is certain features on non-invasive testing, like stress dobutamine stress testing, which can give you a clue that this person would cause benefit by revascularization prior to an elective non-cardiac surgery that can wait. What are these? If you see a reversible large anterior wall defect. So it's not uh, dyskinetic, but it is hypokinetic, but a large anterior wall defect. There are multiple reversible defects. Uh, an ischemia that is occurring at a low heart rate so you don't have, the heart rate is not going up, but there is ischemic changes happening. Uh, there are extensive stress induced wall motion abnormalities. And even there is a transient ischemic dilatation. It's not long term, but it is transient. So these are some of the indications, uh, indices wherein you think revascularization will be needed. Should Prophylactic revascularization be done before non-cardiac uh, surgery. And then we're talking about somebody who has known coronary artery disease, but is stable. Say, for example, has a CCS of 2, NYHA of 2, good functional status, uh, MET score of 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, DASI scores uh, above, above 34. So the Consensus opinion today, based on evidence, is there is no benefit in improving the perioperative outcomes by doing a prophylactic revascularization. And uh, uh, this is which is known to us for the last 15, 20 years. And one of the, I think, the path-breaking publication which led people to believe this was the CARP trial, published in 2004 coronary artery revascularization before major vascular surgeries. And this is possibly the, the highest degree or grade of difficulty other than possibly thoracic surgeries as a non-cardiac surgery, wherein the incidence of perioperative uh, adverse cardiac events are the highest. So the McFall study, the CARB study, they found out that they had basically two arms. One was one patients who underwent revascularization, and that is either with CABG or with a percutaneous intervention and intervention. And the other who went just medical therapy, uh, goal-directed outcomes, and then they underwent the vascular surgery. If you look at the immediate outcomes prior to vascular surgery, there were 10 deaths in the revascularization group versus just one death in the uh, no revascularization group. So right at the beginning, these, uh, the revascularization group did not do well. 
And if you look at the 30 days events, which is in the post-operative period. So this patient survived, underwent the vascular surgery. And if you look at uh, two sides, this is the one side that showed uh, patients who underwent revascularization. And this is the uh, table for patients who did not undergo revascularization. You see, there is no significant change in the all uh, cause outcomes for death, MI, MI based on enzymes, as well as ECG, strokes, uh, renal dysfunction, reoperation, uh, days in the ICU, days in the hospital. So revascularization versus no revascularization, there was hardly any change. And uh, if you look at the kaplar meier curve, and then you know, when you're looking at uh, things which are going up to four years, five years, six years, you fact that you'll find that uh, no revascularizations, the people at risk were actually lower. So which essentially got us to, or got the world to believe that coronary artery revascularization before elective major vascular surgery, which is now equal to major non-cardiac surgery, there is possibly no uh, uh, kind of a, 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 a opinion or no guidance towards doing it. So it is not recommended that you do a coronary artery revascularization either with CAVG or percutaneous intervention prophylactically in a stable patient before a major non-cardiac surgery. So now comes the question, what do you do with an unstable coronary artery disease where a non-cardiac surgery can you can wait? Then you have just obviously two options. You can do a CABG or a percutaneous intervention. Now, is CABG the preferred option? Now, if you go by the Credo Kyoto PCI CABG registry, this is one of those uh, very few to find a cardiology trial which has been not find, funded by any pharmacological uh, or the industry. And uh, from that, you find that the risk of primary ischemic outcome was not significantly different between the CABG group versus the PCI group. But in the CABG group uh, versus the PCI group, it was associated with a lower bleeding risk. You find a hazard risk of a ratio of only 0.36 in the CABG group. So maybe based on this, some people were of the idea that a CABG could be a preferred option. Uh, essentially, this bleeding risk is lower because post CABG, you can be just on aspirin. You don't need a dual antiplatelet therapy, and uh, it can uh, it can the this can the patient can go in for non cardiac surgery. The problem with CABG is just the risk involved in undergoing that procedure. That is intraoperative uh, issues. Then the issue about recuperation, rehabilitation, which is time consuming, the issues with wound healing, the huge issue with sternal dehiscence. And if especially if you're uh, then thinking of uh, doing a non-cardiac surgery on the neck, on the thorax or in the upper abdomen, this becomes a big, big issue. And also how much is the uh, uh, the the uh, the uh, how well behaved are the lungs post surgery and how quickly can they undergo another major uh, surgical insult is a huge issue with CAPG. The problem with PCI, percutaneous intervention, is the problem with the dual antiplatelet therapy. We know that 10% of cardiac deaths after stent placement are attributable to stent thrombosis, and uh, it is essentially because of the delayed endothelization, which is that the neointimal coverage is not happening, and that leads to early instant thrombus formation. Now, how long can we wait for this? If after a percutaneous intervention and you do a non-elective surgery and the question can be addressed in another way you know that this person is waiting for a non-cardiac surgery the person needs percutaneous intervention or revascularization so if i can wait for a given days what should be my revascularization percutaneous revascularization of choice so the traditional advice has been that if you can wait for uh, around 30 days and not beyond 30 days, then just uh, balloon angioplasty or POBA is the preferred option. If you can wait beyond 30 days but cannot wait beyond six months, then the best option is bare metal stents. 
But if you can wait beyond 180 days, and this is in the last five, seven years, previously it used to be 365 days, one year, uh, then you can go ahead with tragilutin stent. This has undergone a change over the last five years or so. And especially this is because of the second generation tragilutin stents that have come in. And again, the traditional advice, I say this is volume two, is that if you can wait for 14 days and not beyond 14 days, then go ahead and just do a balloon angioplasty. If you can wait up to two months, 60 days, then maybe bare metal stents. And if you can wait beyond 60 days, then think of drug eluting stents. Uh, but this also is being severely questioned now. Prior to this, I think this is, I think I have, I'll keep coming back and saying this again and again. When you're thinking of doing a revascularization prior to a non-cardiac surgery, think whether both the percutaneous intervention is absolutely needed. The person deserves it. How much uh, the, does the patient deserve the non-cardiac surgery? In the non-cardiac surgery, what is the risk of bleeding and the consequences of non uh, risk of bleeding due in this surgery? And this, all this, whether they need revascularization, whether they need uh, the non-cardiac surgery, when, which one needs to be done, has to be a consensus between the surgeon, cardiologist, anesthesiologist, the patient, and the relatives. If it was an ideal scenario, the non-cardiac surgery can wait, then please go ahead and do a percutaneous intervention, delay the elective surgery for six months, let them be on dual antiplatelet for six months, and then take the patient up for non-cardiac surgery. The risk of adverse cardiac events are much less in that scenario. Unfortunately, you will not be uh, able to do it in most of your clinical settings. You find that, yes, I can wait, but I cannot wait maybe beyond four weeks, maybe beyond six weeks. If these are intermediate equity surgeries. De definitely, I can't wait beyond three months. The person needs to be uh, taken up. And But you need to revascularize. You need to be, these patients need to be on dual antiplatelets. Uh, they should they will be on a short difference in the dual antiplatelet. And if you look at data that came up 10 years or 15 years back, even then you figured out 2012, may not 15 years, maybe is eight or 10 years back, then they figured out that the risk of adverse cardiac event early, the difference between bare metal stent and drug eluting stent was hardly anything, especially in when you're discontinuing the dual antiplatelet therapy. It was then that the quality of evidence was low. Come the second generation drug eluting stents versus the bare metal stents, today you don't have any evidence to suggest that the use of bare metal stents compared with drug eluting stents allows for a shorter period of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. And there is a strong evidence from the ZUS trial, from the leaders free, from the senior trial, all cardiology trials, suggesting that cardiovascular outcomes are better with drug eluting stents when dual antiplatelet therapy is used for a shorter period. So if you need to actually stop it, don't put in a bare metal, it's still better for a drug eluting. If, if you come to our institution and talk with our cardiologist, all of them will give you the same opinion. Now you have a person who has got undergone a revascularization, is on dual antiplatelet and on a non-cardiac surgery. The ideal, in an ideal situation, continue it for six months, discontinue the, uh, uh, the uh, platelet receptor blocker for a short duration as possible and continue the aspirin. This is what the cardiologist will be the most happiest. The surgeons are sometimes happy, sometimes not happy. Assess the risk of bleeding, especially if it is something like a, uh, a neurosurgery, a, a, a intradurals, even a spine surgery, posterior chamber of the eye surgery, prost uh, prostate surgery. The risk of bleeding is extremely high. You have to stop. You it is advisable to stop both. If you have stopped the clopidogrel or any of these uh, platelet receptor blockers, start it as a. Uh, what are the guidelines for stopping this P2Y12 inhibitors prior to non-cardiac surgery? Clopidogrel is for five days. Prasugrel is for seven days. Takagirar is for three to five days. If you have stopped it, restart it with a loading dose in consultation with the surgeon. And uh, some people say 300 milligram. Some people would say 600 milligram as early as possible. And uh, 
patients with these stains where the dual antiplatelet therapy has been stopped for a brief period of for a brief period of time and early on it is wiser to do any of this non cardiac surgery where you have a backup for 24 hour interventional cardiology cover because if something happens then your only option is to go in and open up the uh, stents again uh, is there a role of platelet transfusion patients who are at increased risk of bleeding and where you had uh, hardly any time to discontinue it can be used as for excessive bleeding after surgery there is no role as yet from any evidence of a prophylactic platelet transfusion before non-cardiac surgery in that scenario. How much does bridging or an alternative therapy to dual antiplatelet therapy works? People have tried the GP2B3A inhibitors such, such as tyrofiban and ftfibidate, and uh, some academic centers have uh, used this strategy in high-risk patients of, uh, for high risk of stent thrombosis but the bleeding associated with it is much higher and possibly in, uh, in in experienced hands in most surgeons will possibly not be very happy doing it so not very recommended should we start heparin low molecular weight heparin as an alternative to dual antiplatelet therapy i think the british medical bulletin in 2017 this was a lovely lovely review please go through it uh if it, it completely gives you an opinion on this the parental anticoagulants such as heparin do not decrease the risk of stent thrombosis and therefore should not be used as a substitute to antiplatelet therapy commonly used but uh, without much evidence behind it so how medical management helps in decreasing the risk we'll give, go back to the same cartoon if you look at it uh, the inflammatory response is taken care of by the statins the antiplatelets and the nitrates Whereas the neuroendocrine response is taken care of by the alpha-2 agonists, the uh, uh, analgesics, the inflammatory, uh, the metabolic response, you can try it with insulin and the neuroendocrine, the catecholamine surge taken care of by the beta blockers. Add to this, if you have hypotension, you use vasopressors, you have bleeding, you increase the oxygen capacity by transfusing PRBCs, giving extra oxygen, and uh, obviously war keeping the patient warm so trying to see that the milieu is not changed so much and you manage it that well so what about the management of the cardiovascular drugs i'll just what i will do is each of these drugs i will just go by what is the acc aha 2014 recommendations so please go through that text and just this is a revision of that text nothing that is my opinion it is just what is what the accah uh, tells you uh, this is a uh, straightforward patients chronically on beta blockers continue beta blockers uh, category of recommendation is one uh, on beta blockers uh, should we give them beta club course in the post-operative uh, period? It is obviously according to clinical circumstances. If you find a person hypotensive in the beta blocker uh, in the post-operative period, a bradycardic, you don't, obviously don't give it. Intermediate or high risk of myocardial ischemia, which is noted in the pre-operative uh, testing, it is and not on beta blockers. It is reasonable to begin perioperative beta blockers so the first thing they say is reasonable to begin and now the question will come when to begin in patients of three or more uh, least cardiac risk index factors but among uh, whether if they have three of these six it may be reasonable to again begin beta blockers before non-cardiac surgery those who are not on that uh, again, the same thing for those who should be on a beta blocker, you start a beta blocker and now they are coming. When do you start? It is preferably that you do it two to four weeks prior to surgery. So your best benefit is possibly two to four weeks prior to surgery. Uh, a compelling long term indication. But there is no. Uh, the RCRI is score is one or less uh, one, then just initiating a beta blocker in the perioperative on the preoperative for to reducing just the risk of the surgery is there is the people have said that it is of uncertain benefit. Again, 
we first heard from them is that it is preferably two to four weeks. If you have missed the bus two to four weeks and you think that they should have been on uh, beta blockers has not been on beta blockers and should be on long term beta blockers at least start it one day prior to surgery and till or if you till you take the time to reach the target heart rate of 7280. And I think this is a cat category three recommendation that beta blockers should not be, I think that it should not be started on the day of surgery. I think the POIS study clearly brought that out. So what is the choice of agent? There is no strong evidence which suggests that one agent is better than another. So don't try to switch beta blockers. Uh, the agents that have shown benefit are the ones they are usually one are the selective card, uh, beta one cardio selective ones, whether it is atenolol, metoprolol or bisoprolol, even between the three of them, there has been no evidence to suggest which is one is superior to the other. So do not try to change or uh, manipulate these agents in the uh, preoperative period. Target is a heart rate of 60 to 70. Blood pressure, should I give a beta blocker on the morning of surgery? You give this uh, beta blocker if the systolic blood pressures are 100 and greater than 130. Uh, if it is between 115 to 130, then give half the dose. This is what again, the 2014. And if it is less than 115, uh, withhold the beta blockers. So essentially what we try to do is uh, instead of doing the 150, we find the 120 mark easier to operate with. What about the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin uh, receptor blockers? I think this, the evidence has been like a yo-yo. We first heard that uh, anybody with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, do not give it because they will cause severe perioperative hypotension. Then came, uh, Few years later, ACCH is saying that uh, no, if they were on long term ACE inhibitors, ARBs given for heart failure, remodeling of the left ventricle, they should be given the ACE or the ARB prior to surgery. 2014, I hope they come out with something more definitive. It says that if continuation of the ACE or ARBs is reasonable, they're not saying that it can be done, should not be done, it is up to you. But if you have withdrawn it prior to surgery, please restart it as quickly as you can in the post-operative period. So it has left it to you. What we usually would do if it is a major surgery where you think that the fluid shifts is going to be much more. And if you think that there is a high risk of hypotension that is going to be happening, we possibly withhold the ACE and the ARP on the morning of surgery. Alpha-2 agonist, there is no role of clonidine to be used to do hemodynamic uh, manipulations in the perioperative period at all, category three. Statins, patients with coronary artery disease or a coronary equivalent like DM, CAD, uh, carotid artery disease, peripheral artery disease, with a, with, they should receive statin therapy. That's what uh, some people would disagree. I think this is some evidence which has come up in the last year or so, which possibly now uh, puts this very emphatic statements into question. But till then, I think we go in with this. So continue statin therapy. And there is also a 2B recommendation saying that you can start statin therapy in this group of individuals. Uh, about What about nitrates? Uh, the recommendation is that it is not recommended prophylactically. If they have been on nitrates, they continue. And this is after the 2016 Cochrane review. There was not a uh, significant difference in the primary study, all cause mortality for 30, uh, 30 days about any preparation of nitrate. And because there is this issue that it can cause, decrease the preload, which can outweigh its benefit, which is why uh, based upon that nitrate, that you use prophylactically is not recommended. Antiplatelet therapy, I think we went through this extensively. I will not go through this again. If uh, uh, after bare metal stents, it's, I think a lot of this will change over the years. So it's whether it's six weeks or six months 
and uh, again it, if you if you have to stop you can stop the clopidogrel do not stop the aspirin continue the aspirin into the uh, intraoperative phase restart the clopidogrel as quickly as you can and um, this decision is uh, taken not only by the anesthesiologist but it's a consensus opinion of the cardiologist the surgeon and he has to come in about the risk of bleeding and its consequences things like neurosurgery you need to stop both uh, there is no point in giving aspirin to just a person who has got a coronary artery disease no and uh, no uh, uh, stents in uh, place no previous history of cabg just starting an aspirin does not uh, reduce the uh, risk of a perioperative adverse cardiac event so that is about the things and let us now close it by looking at the answers to the poll questions which essentially is uh, are the take home messages from this deliberation so which of the following is not or does not have anti platelet uh, action i found it was there was a split in opinion between um, uh, ibuprofen and heparin and uh, can we have the poll results now no i think we can't anyway so the answer to this is heparin does not have anti platelet action so which is why you cannot use heparin to uh, replace the dual anti platelet uh, dual anti platelet therapy and anti platelet action uh, this is i think uh, interesting uh, ca breast undergoes uh, stenting on dual antiplatelet therapy comes after 6 weeks what will you do i think uh, there, there 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 has been a kind of difference of opinion in this that i saw uh i would be tempted and our policy would be uh, i think uh, this is again it has to be decided upon between you and your surgeon we would be happy just by continuing aspirin and clopidogrel and proceed for surgery uh think because it's going to be a surface surgery um uh, and uh, if if you can use dathemi properly there is hardly any uh, blood loss or bleeding uh, despite the huge raw surface that you create but since it's a surface surgery pressure can be of great help but the more conservative op op option would be that you stop clopidogrel continue with it have aspirin on board remember it is happened within 6 weeks or 8 weeks and you proceed for surgery uh, as we realized over the deliberation hardly any role in having something like low molecular heparin or even the gp2b3 receptor blockers what happens in the same scenario if it is now a scenario of neurosurgery i think uh, i think most of you would have uh, would uh, kind of i saw uh, take the this option and which is uh, you stop both the dual antiplatelet therapy and then proceed for surgery because uh, this is these are the areas where in a small a 5 ml uh, hematoma can have disastrous neurological consequences so see if you the, the type of surgery can change the type of management so thyroidectomy in a stable coronary artery disease good functional status what will you do will you do revascularization i think prof and the stable coronary artery disease does prophylactic revascularization help i think we discussed this that uh, there is no role of doing a prophylactic revascularization maximize the medical therapy and then proceed with thyroidectomy and once this uh, surgery is done then think of possibly addressing the coronary artery disease problem so that was about uh, stable coronary artery disease and finally about beta blockers this person has you can see he has a rcri score of possibly 3 and is if is going in for a um, major surgery and uh, you need a uh, heart rate control so what is going to be the ideal thing in an ideal scenario if you can wait i think i think most of you again got there was a between between the first and the second so the drug doesn't matter the target matters so atenolol four weeks prior to surgery would be possibly the uh, way to go ahead so that is about it thank you very much and uh, do we have
questions. So I think this is uh, from Dr. Rakesh Kapoor. When do you advise for an echocardiography in an ASA-1 geriatric patient? I think the first thing is uh, uh, in the current ASA, you would possibly somebody who uh, qualifies as a geriatric person would automatically become ASA-2. And uh, the thing is, uh, whether you want to do an LV evaluation, it, it all... It, it will again depend upon if this uh, uh, if this geriatric person comes in for an ingrowing toenail removal. I don't think I will do an LV evaluation. But if the person is coming in for um, a gallbladder removal surgery, I would do an LV evaluation. If the person gives me a history of coronary artery disease, if the person uh, 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 I am not able to figure out how the functional status of this person is. Uh, I will look for an LV evaluation. So it will depend upon uh, what situation, what is the clinical profile of, you can have an 80 year old who has a physiological age of 60, and you can have a 60 year old who is a, who is a cripple. So age itself. Uh, cannot. Anybody, uh, anybody wants, anybody uh, wants to make a comment, you can uh, just uh, uh, take your cursor down to request to speak on the top that you have. And uh, I think Jyoti will uh, let you put your opinion over there. Uh, Dr. Rupan Bhaduri wants to know the, the GP2B3 receptors before non cardiac surgery after a PCI. I think if you go by the recommendations, uh, there is uh, currently there is no strong evidence saying that bridging with the GP2B3 receptors uh, are of any benefit. In, in fact, it, uh, the, the flip side to it is increases the risk of bleeding. So, uh, I think five, six years back, there was this uh, there was this thing about bridging with GP2B3A. Currently, if you look by data, I think there is no not much of a value by uh, of adding a GP2B3A receptors. Uh, thank you, John Tudop, for being here. Uh, can a preoperative beta blocker precipitate heart failure who already has a heart history of heart failure? I think this is a very good question. I think uh, the carvedilol trials have you know, unequivocally shown that uh, uh, patients with uh, heart with, uh, LV, uh, that uh, beta blockers have actually worked out towards their benefit. So only thing you have to uh, be careful about is uh, which beta blocker you're using in a person who has, who is, in decompensated heart failure, if it is compensated heart failure, doesn't matter that much. So uh, uh, the uh, when we were students, I think it was a big no that a patient with a heart failure or a history of heart failure do not give beta blocker. I think that is no more the query. So it, it, it well, in fact, a higher heart rate, the person might have a greater propensity to get into an heart failure. Good evening, Anjula. Thank you for being here. In case of emergency surgery, what should be the choice of beta blocker therapy? I think if it is emergency surgery and uh, the person uh, the person is has been on beta blockers, uh, I think you you won't have the time to give an oral beta blocker. Uh, but if you actually need to give anything intravenous to uh, manipulate the hemodynamics, uh, the our policy would be we would start off with something very uh, with a short acting so that even if it uh, does anything, it will for a longer, shorter period of time. So maybe try it with the uh, 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 esmolol, and then if you think that it will be eventually, then look for a metoprolol. Uh, 
Uh, again, uh, I think a lot of interest about bridging therapy. I think I, I would ask uh, Dibendu also to uh, put in his opinion over here about whether Kangrelor can be beneficial. Again, I think the data is not towards using bridging anything. So, I think uh, yes, at present, uh, bridging therapy is it's not very much recommended. Let, let yes, into the perioperative phase, and then look at it. Dibendu, what would you have to say on this? Yeah, I, I do agree with you, sir. The same thing, I think even the cardiologists in our institution also do suggest the same thing. Like uh, for non-cardiac surgery, obviously the bridging therapy patients are underlying having already in stent. It's not much recommended because of the chances. And with high risk surgery, and a minor bleeding can lead on to major effects. It's one of the contraindications. So. Yeah. Only single therapy, du dual therapy is no more recommended until unless the patient has underlying complications like uh, the patient has a long stent and a complicated coronary artery disease and post PCI. So they do get, when it, the cardiologists do suggest that. But otherwise, single therapy would be best enough and to avoid preoperative and then start immediate post op as discussed. Correct. Uh... Anjun has a question about uh, standard recommendation for stopidocle. Yeah, okay. I think that's a very good point, Anjun, that you make. Is uh, the ASRA classically says is seven days for, and this is when you're thinking of putting in a putting in blocks, and this is when you're thinking of uh, instrumenting possibly the central neuroaxis uh, and putting in catheters that uh, the ASRA recommendation would be seven. This is the ACC AHA. This is about uh, what is more about surgical bleeding than the risk of uh, uh, a central neuroaxis hematoma. But I think, this is my personal opinion, I think we will have a revisit on this, especially with uh, the advent of ultrasound in regional anesthesia, wherein uh, uh, I think you might look at changes to these guidelines happening. Yeah, I guess, sir. Whether, yeah, whether you can go ahead and do uh, blocks in patients with, but don't quote me on this. But uh, this is my personal belief, uh, sir. If you want, uh, don't mind. I can just add on to this. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, uh, actually, what we are doing it, and obviously under guidance of Dr. Singhupta, sir, we've been doing it uh, regularly in minimal invasive cardiac surgery. And our uh, perioperative cardiac surgery, the surgeons actually really don't want to stop the antiplatelets. They really do take up. This is not a quotation or uh, quoted by any guidelines, but what the present uh, practice by most of the surgeons around is, they do prefer only to stop maximum of 72 hours of patients having coronary artery disease coming for CABGs and coming to uh, neuraxial blockade. Uh, we don't do central, and obviously the times are changing because to prevent all the complications of central neuraxial blockade, all the peripheral neuraxial blockades are coming into uh, now more into practice. And we do like serratus anterior block uh, blockage with along with catheters. And we have done uh, lots of patients. We have already uh, done thesis on this. And while practicing, we have never seen any of the patients developing hematoma or uh, bleeding complications because the antiplatelets were continued very near to the surgery. So I guess the ch changes of even the neural uh, blockade therapy is more into peripheral rather than central. So obviously the complication rates are very minimal. And, and if you, you can understand that cardiac surgeons, they're operating more into vascular structures with antiplatelets and even on heparin. So I guess that uh, thing is more a dilemma rather than a practice guidelines. Correct. I completely agree with you, Dibendu. Because we have seen our experience with uh, serratus anterior. We have seen our experience with erector spiny plane block. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, under under vision, you know, you can see where the intercostal artery is, and you'd see where you are going, which is what is the needle direction. So. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Jayati to wind up and uh, just guide them as to what they need to do after they uh, end this session.